Imagine an eight-year-old boy with a carefree outlook on life where his biggest worry was what game he'd play with his friends after he returned home from school. Then imagine his world being turned upside down where facing hatred and bigotry becomes part of his daily life. Imagine him having the opportunity to leave that horrible world only to have his port of exit bombed 48 hours before his scheduled departure and being trapped in Nazi Europe. My name is Dan Thalheimer, and I'm here to tell you the story of my grandfather, Walter Thalheimer, who through perseverance, a minute to minute approach to survival, and what some might call fate, managed to survive the Holocaust. Every story of survival is unique. The story of my grandfather is unique as he was one of the few Holocaust survivors who experienced the entire Nazi era from the very beginning of its power to its final decline. I'm fortunate that my grandfather documented his testimony in a variety of ways, including being interviewed on video by the Shoah Foundation in 1995. My story today will include clips from that interview, so you have the opportunity to hear some of his words directly. On October 5th, 1925, my grandfather was born into what would be considered an upper middle class family in the small southern Germany town of Oregon. He, his parents, Arthur and Bianca, his older sister by three and a half years, Trudel, and their wonderful German shepherd, Tell, after William Tell, lived in a beautiful home that resembled a chalet with a lovely large garden and a live-in maid. His father and two brothers owned and operated a paint and varnish factory in town, and free time was spent with family eating meals and playing games. Arthur, my great-grandfather, was a veteran of the German army from World War I and was part of an artillery outfit. Arthur was highly decorated and received the second highest commendation bestowed upon veterans. In January 1933, when Hitler came to power in Germany, my grandfather was not quite eight years old. Up to that time, he had led a life of innocent bliss like any child deserves. In Oregon, which had a Jewish population of about 5,000, there grew to be a very strong Nazi element. With, his, with Hitler's rise, anti-Jewish demonstrations became more and more common and culminated in the arrest of all Jewish men who were on their way to synagogue one particular day, including Arthur. During their stay in the local prison, the men were subjected to many kinds of indignities and beatings. Civil law had completely broken down. The prisoners had had to march through the streets of town with a communist flag to show the townspeople that all Jews were communists, even though none of them actually were. My great grandfather was released from prison after three days due to his military record. Others were detained longer. As for my grandfather's own experiences at the time, they were almost as bad considering his age. The Jewish children were constantly abused, attacked, and made fun of by gangs of older non-Jewish kids who delighted in their feeling of superiority. All of the children his age, many of whom he had been friends with, became members of the Hitler Youth. The non-Jewish children would sing songs that translated to, if Jewish blood splashes off of the knives, things will be twice as good. Being scared and humiliated became a way of life until in 1936, when my great-grandparents decided it cannot go on like this. They sold their house for a fraction of its true value and moved the entire family to Stuttgart, a larger city not too far away. During this time, Hitler and the Nazi party continued passing laws to make the lives of Jews more and more difficult. Stores and institutions put up signs saying, Jews not allowed. After not wanting to give up on Germany, their home country for generations, they finally began to doubt their original assumption that the Hitler era was only a temporary condition and would blow over like so many governments before. My great grandmother had a cousin who had moved to New York in the 1920s and became very wealthy. Shortly after arriving in Stuttgart, she reached out to him to request help and sponsor the immigration to the United States. However, this cousin said no, and that he had done enough to already help other relatives come to the US and he was no longer interested in helping any others. So for the time being, any hope of leaving for America was hopeless. Then came November 9th, 1938, commonly known as Kristallnacht. Hundreds of synagogues throughout Germany were burned and destroyed, including the one in Stuttgart where my grandfather at age 13 was bar mitzvahed. 
In fact, his bar mitzvah was the last to ever take place in that synagogue. Jewish stores were broken into and looted and 30,000 Jewish men, including one of my grandfather's uncles, were arrested and sent to concentration camps. Jews were beaten and robbed and had to surrender all their valuables to the state. This included my grandfather's gold wristwatch he was given as a bar mitzvah gift by his parents only three weeks before. Overnight, things had changed completely. Everyone finally realized the only possible salvation was to leave Germany. Meanwhile, my family remembered that they had some other cousins who moved from Germany to the United States in the 1890s. However, they had lost touch and didn't know where they lived. And remember, Google didn't exist back then. So how can you locate someone? They reached out to the same cousin as before for help. Remember the one who wouldn't sponsor them to come to the US? This time, however, he did agree to hire a detective to find these other cousins. It turned out one was living in Little Rock, Arkansas and the other in Greenwood, Mississippi. They were contacted via telegram and were more than willing to sponsor my family's immigration to, to the US. However, before they could leave Germany, they had to wait for a US visa, a wait which lasted until April, 1940, nearly one and a half years. With visas finally in hand, my grandfather's passage was booked through Rotterdam, one of only two remaining ports of exit from Europe. A few weeks later, they were notified that the HMS Veen Dam had arrived in the harbor and was scheduled to set sail for the US on May 11th. They traveled from Stuttgart to Rotterdam and arrived the evening of May 9th with an almost indescribable feeling of exhilaration, having finally escaped seemingly in the 11th hour, the raging tiger of Nazi Germany. That evening, however, at 3.30 in the morning, they were awakened by gunfire. Germany had invaded the Netherlands. Rotterdam was immediately surrounded by German forces and no ships would be able to leave the port. Five days later, the Dutch Marines who were defending Rotterdam surrendered to a German ultimatum. Let's hear what happened after the Dutch surrendered. Exactly one hour later at one o'clock in the afternoon, the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, came across the city without a shot being fired against them and systematically bombed and destroyed the entire inner city of Rotterdam. And we were right in the middle of it. And in Rotterdam, you don't have cellars. So, because if you dig two feet down, you get groundwater. So there's, we were on even level and uh, in this butcher store. And the four of us, we embraced each other. We expected to be killed any minute because the bombs were falling all around us. And finally a bomb uh, fell in the back of the house. It started burning, the beams were coming down, the ceiling beams. And somebody else in there said, let's all get out. And we ran out into the streets, and there we found, first of all, about six inches of glass from all the broken windows of the streets all around us. Uh, bomb craters in the streets, where in some areas there was only about three or four feet that were still passable, and thousands of people fleeing. And we just joined them. We didn't speak the language. We were strangers in the city, so we just followed the crowd. And we ran with them for about two hours, running through burning streets. We didn't know what, where, and how. And all of a sudden, after some time, we got out into a forest, and there we spent the night. And we didn't dare open our mouth, because even though my sister and I spoke some English, my parents didn't, and we didn't speak Dutch. And if we had spoken German, they would have probably torn us limb from limb after what the Germans just had done to them. And I couldn't have blamed them, blamed them. So we... There they were, less than 48 hours from freedom, and now they were stuck in a war zone in the middle of the Nazi nightmare. <clears throat> My grandfather was now 14 years old and had suffered much despair. After everything he and his family had been through, they were seemingly back to square one. Through the bombing, all of their possessions that were intended to join them on the boat to America were destroyed. In a relatively short time, they had gone from a, a once very comfortable lifestyle to having absolutely nothing. Upon this feeling of absolute helplessness, 
It was the first time my grandfather ever saw his dad cry. My family would remain in Rotterdam for four months until the city was declared a war zone by the Germans. They were transported to the southern Dutch town of Maastricht. However, having received only a transit visa to the Netherlands, they were not considered residents and Arthur was not allowed to work to make a living. So they were financially supported by the Dutch Jewish committee for the next two years. My grandfather, however, had started an apprenticeship as a tool and die maker. Almost every night they were awakened by air raid alarms and twice they had to move out of their small apartment because of damage to their building. Then came August, 1942. My family received a notice in the mail to report two days later to the train station in Maastricht, taking only one duffel bag per person. They were informed they were being sent to work camps in Eastern Europe. This fact left them with two courses of action. They could either go underground or report as directed. My grandfather's tool and die maker boss had a place that they could hide. However, there was a problem with going into hiding. At that time in the Netherlands, all food was being rationed due to the war and could only be purchased with ration stamps. A single month's supply of these stamps were available from a government agency upon presentation of one's ID card and Jewish ID cards were marked by a big letter J. Since all Jews were scheduled to be deported, no ID card with the letter J could be presented to obtain food stamps. And my grandfather's boss would only get enough of a monthly supply of stamps to provide food for his family. If one had the money to buy a forged ID card without a J and four ID cards would cost about $20,000, it would be possible to get the monthly supply of stamps. Or if one had enough money to buy food stamps on the black market, which cost about $30,000 per year, one could do the same. Since my family had no money at the time, the option of hiding was not available. The only thing left to do was obey the letter and report to the assembly point as requested. Maastricht had a Jewish population of 600 at that time. About 500 men, women and children assembled that August morning in the train station. The other hundred seemingly had gone into hiding. After many hours of waiting, they were finally put on to a special train, destination Westerbork concentration camp. When my family first arrived in Westerbork, the first task was to be registered. An index card was made for everyone entering the camp. They were also informed that several possibilities existed to obtain deferments from being transferred to other camps. One such deferment was for men who had fought as German soldiers in World War I and had been decorated for their bravery. This happened to be the case with my great grandfather. After presenting proof of this, my family was told to proceed to their barracks. Westerbork had separate camps for men and women, both enclosed by barbed wire. Each barrack housed several hundred people sleeping on triple deck beds. Prisoners were packed in like sardines and tempers often flared due to lack of privacy. Normally, there were transports leaving Westerbork twice a week, but before my family's names could be listed for transport, they were informed that my great-grandfather's request for deferment had been granted, and my family was permitted to stay in Westerbork until further notice. Their delight at this news, however, was considerably dampened by the fact that they were the only ones of all their friends who had come with them from Maastricht to be deferred. They sadly said goodbye to their friends, and even though they had no idea what fate was to await them, they could not shake the feeling of doom that was connected with the word transport. Every day, new people arrived, and almost like clockwork, twice a week, a transport would leave. Since my family was deferred, they were incorporated into the working community of the camp. My grandfather's first assignment was garbage detail. It was not the most pleasant job, but it gave him the opportunity to access the women's camp, which allowed him to communicate with his mother and sister. The garbage detail lasted a few weeks, and after holding a few other jobs, my grandfather began to notice the camp's messengers, boys about his age, who wore special blue armbands, which enabled them to enter any and all areas, even the most restricted. He was intrigued by this and applied to the supervisor. After several weeks, he was informed that his application had been approved and he was given a blue armband, the greatest benefit of which was that he now had access to the central card files, which were used for assembling transports. 
The first thing he did as a messenger was to make his family's registration cards disappear. He destroyed his parents, sisters, and his own cards, reasoning that if there were no index cards, they could not possibly be sent away from Westerbork. He also managed to do the same for friends who arrived later in transport from Rotterdam. Little did he know, however, that others had the same idea. This created a difficult situation. The German SS would request a certain number of people for each transport. Because of the efforts of various messengers, at one point, only 400 registration cards remained in the entire filing system for a transport that required 800 people. The Nazis were furious as it was clear that someone was messing with their card system. As a result, they ordered every living soul in the camp to the Central Assembly Square to wait under heavy armed guard. The SS proceeded to register each and every person again. This process took three days and three nights and the new set of index cards was guarded 24 seven by the SS. They assembled the transport list from these new cards pulling names randomly without regard to whether a person was deferred or not. My entire family was on that new list. Destination, Auschwitz. But once again, my grandfather's ingenuity came to light. Each person designated for transport had to be deregistered. This took place in the main registration building and from there, people were directly escorted to the train. When selected for transport, if you were a messenger, you were supposed to give up your blue armband. However, my grandfather hid his blue armband in his pocket, and after deregistration, he assembled his mother, father, and sister, slipped his hidden blue armband back on, and escorted them out of the side entrance, telling the guard at the door that he was given official orders to escort these people to another building. The bluff worked, and again, they were safe for a little while. In late summer of 1943, all adults who were deferred due to military service in World War I were ordered to be transported to Theresienstadt concentration camp in Czechoslovakia. This included my great grandparents and in January 1944, all children of this deferral group, including my grandfather and his sister would follow. It was wonderful for my grandfather and his sister to be reunited with their parents after a separation of about five months. However, they were shocked to see how thin and weak Arthur and Bianca had become. The food in Westerbork had been in short supply, but due to my grandfather's connections, he was able to supplement it enough for his family to get by. In Theresienstadt, things were different. There, the Czechoslovakian inmates had all the influential jobs and my family, who were considered newcomers, were low on the totem pole. The meals were always insufficient and hunger was a daily companion. Theresienstadt itself was very similar to Westerbork in administrative structure, and even though they had heard rumors about atrocities occurring in other camps, their daily lives did not change too much from before. Constant rumors about the killing of Jews were discounted. After all, they were alive, and except for too little food, nobody to this point had attempted to inflict physical harm on any of my family members. Furthermore, to the best of their knowledge, Nobody had been transported from Theresienstadt in over a year. And so they lived, quartered like sardines, always hungry, all pursuing the daily tasks assigned to them, but on the whole, relatively tranquil. My grandfather hoped that somehow he would spend the balance of the war without much further change. That, however, was not to be the case. By September 1944, rumors of new transports started popping up, and by the beginning of October, these rumors proved to be true. A list of 2000 names to be deported to Auschwitz was published and my grandfather and his father were on the list. They, along with 2000 others were taken into an attic to await their train. Days passed and they had hoped that maybe, just maybe, the Nazis couldn't find a train for transport. However, even though many times the Germans didn't have transportation for their own soldiers, they always found trains to take Jews to their death. That was the priority. After 10 days in that attic, the train finally arrives. Leaving both his mother and sister behind, my grandfather and his dad managed to stay together and along with about 80 other people were herded into one of many rail cars. It was too crowded for everyone to lie or sit on the floor. So everyone devised rules to take turns standing and lying down. And as for going to the bathroom. And no, toilet facilities, 
except some straw in one corner. And there the 80 of us, men, women and children, had to relieve ourselves in front of each other. If you could think of anything more dehumanizing or more degrading, I'd like to know. It was devastating. Since the train car had no windows, my grandfather and a few of his friends tried to dislodge one of the ventilation panels to get at least a little bit of daylight and some fresh air. When they were nearly complete, they suddenly heard gunshots and bullets whizzing past their heads. The voices of guards who were sitting on top of the rail cars warned them that if they, were touched, if they touched the ventilation panel again, the next bullets would not miss their targets. The gravity of their situation began to dawn on them very quickly. Suddenly, the previously discounted rumors about the killing of Jews began to take a more realistic form. No one spoke, and silently, the minutes and miles brought them further and further from the last bit of civilization they had known. After two days and two nights of travel, the train finally stopped. The doors, which had all been padlocked, were opened. They had arrived at Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland. As soon as their eyes became accustomed to the daylight, they saw they were on a very long platform. Across from each rail car was a machine gun emplacement manned by an SS guard. They were ordered to get out of the rail cars and walk single file past an officer who had placed himself at the very end of the train platform. The line moved very slowly and there was a terrible odor in the air. The stench was sickening and for the life of him, my grandfather could not identify the source of this smell. Arthur was directly in front of him in line, and when it came time for him to confront the SS officer, he was asked his age, and upon reply, was waved to join a group of others assembling to the right. My grandfather was then motioned to join another group assembled to the left. That was the last time my grandfather saw his dad. In this next video, where my grandfather explains what happened next to him and the rest of the group that was assembled to the left, the kapos he mentions were prisoners, many of whom were hardened criminals whose work assignment was to supervise other prisoners. Let's watch. And these kapos had big clubs and they started beating us mercilessly on our heads wherever they could find a spot. But they also talked. And they said, you guys are lucky. I said, what do you mean you're lucky? You're beating us half to death. How can we be lucky? Oh, he said, because all the others that went to the other side by now have been gassed and killed. Well, my father, my friends, but I did not my, allow myself to let it even penetrate what this gruesome thing meant. Because at this point, we were, most of us, were mostly concerned with trying to fend off the clubs. And they said, oh, by the way, what you're smelling here, that odor that you probably never smelled before, those are the bodies burning. And now we knew. And that was how my grandfather learned that his father was murdered. Arthur Thalheimer was 54 years old at the time, and like 1,900 other people in his transport, he did not survive. My grandfather was 19. His selection to join the group to the left was pure dumb luck. Many, the same age as my grandfather, did not fare so well and were asked to join the, the group to the right. Four gas chambers and four crematoriums, all located along the western edge of the camp, were busily engaged each day and night. The surviving 100 people from the transport were marched to a building where they were told to completely undress and to keep only their shoes and belt if they had one. Hair was removed from all parts of their body with razors that were completely dull. They were bleeding all over. After a mass shower with cold water, they were handed prison pants and jacket and were marched off to a barrack. Their barrack consisted of two long concrete slabs divided by a medium. No beds, no straw. They were then instructed how to sleep. To sit in a row with their backs against the wall, knees pulled up to their chest, and the next group would use the legs behind them as a backrest. This proceeded for five rows. Each barrack was run by the kapos that were mentioned earlier. My grandfather and other prisoners were beaten and robbed, and the kapos asked those who had gold teeth to volunteer that information. Anyone who had a gold tooth in his mouth was relieved of it with a strategically placed blow from a club. Anyone found to have hidden such a gold tooth would be beaten to death, literally beaten to death, and then the gold tooth would be removed. 
That was life in Auschwitz, or actually, to be more accurate, Birkenau. Auschwitz was a normal concentration camp adjoining Birkenau, which was technically known by the Germans as a Vernichtungslager, or extermination camp. An extermination camp had two purposes, to kill people by the hundreds of thousands and to select people the Nazis thought they could use for their war efforts. About five days after his arrival, my grandfather, because of his skills as a tool and die maker learned during his time in Rotterdam, was chosen for his manual skills to be sent back to Germany to work in the munitions plants. To distinguish those selected from the rest, he received on his forehead a rubber stamp imprinted with the word transport. However, before returning to Germany, my grandfather would spend six more weeks in Birkenau. His days were spent mostly standing outside in formation, rain or shine, and it mostly rained. The ground was muddy and many had been robbed of their last possession, their shoes, and had to stand in the cold rain, barefoot, muddy, and shivering, hour after hour after hour. The barbed wire which ran alongside each barrack and was charged with high voltage was the end of many a person who could not go on any longer. These bodies were left there for everyone else to contemplate. Each day they were issued one piece of bread about three inches wide and a bowl of a watery substance masquerading as soup. Since they had no razors, they could not shave. And even though my grandfather was selected back for transport to Germany, every second day he was still marched past an SS officer for another selection. If anyone sported a three or four day growth of beard, he was considered unfit to live and was sent to the gas chambers. The only ones who possessed razors were the kapos, and they would shave you for a day's bread ration. My grandfather had a heavy beard and had to shave at least every other day to stay alive. So when he would receive his daily bread ration, he would eat half and hide the other half in his shirt. Every other day, he would give his bread ration to the kapo in exchange for a shave in order to survive. Day after day, hour after hour, he had no knowledge of whether he would remain alive. I would ask him how he was able to manage. Here's what he said. Unbelievable mental stress, but the only way I could survive, the way I decided to survive, I made up my mind, I'm going to survive, is to cut out anything past or, or future. I did not reflect back, I didn't project forward. I lived from minute to minute. When I was alive, one minute more, I try to live one minute more. And that's how I spent my six weeks in Birkenau. It was the most horrendous time that I ever, ever had gone through. Finally, after those six horrible weeks in Birkenau, the day came when about 50 people, including my grandfather, were loaded into rail cars, destination Germany. After several days on the train, they arrived at a very large munitions factory and inside the factory grounds, the Nazis had constructed a concentration camp complete with high voltage barbed wire and watchtowers. This served as a satellite camp of Buchenwald. My grandfather was the only tool and die maker in his transport group and he would work 12 hours every day in the factory plus about six hours in addition unloading rail, railroad cars. There was an older German man, not a prisoner who worked alongside him in the factory. The first thing he said to my grandfather was, I'm a communist, which put my grandfather somewhat at ease because of course, if the Nazis found out that this man was in fact a communist, he'd be a prisoner in camp along with the rest. This man was wonderful to my grandfather. He would occasionally share a sandwich he would bring for lunch and he brought my grandfather a new pair of shoes. Mind you, the shoes weren't new, they were old, but they were fully intact and in good condition. A huge upgrade from the torn apart shoes my grandfather had been wearing for the past several years. Remember these shoes, okay? Another story he would tell me about his time in Buchenwald was that after several nearby bombing raids by the allied forces, my grandfather, along with a few others, were chosen to defuse unexploded bombs, which had to be dug up and carefully disarmed. There were three groups of four people. The guards overseeing each group's work were 100 yards away during these operations for fear of being killed, but they did provide, for the first time in many years, more substantial food that could actually stick to their ribs in the form of sandwiches. The guards wanted to make sure that the hands of my grandfather and others were steady when performing their tasks. 
his group was lucky and survived. Another group did not fare that well. As his days in Buchenwald continued to pass, of growing concern was that my grandfather kept getting weaker and the nightly beatings administered by the SS guards for any number of imaginary offenses and watched by the way with great interest by the townspeople on their way home from work did not do much for his morale. By now, it was April, 1945. One morning on the way to the factory, my grandfather heard what sounded like distant thunder. He knew better, however, and so did the Germans. It was American artillery blasting away in the distance. Could it possibly be that the war was nearing its end? There was much confusion, but in spite of it all, the camp commander was able to secure a locomotive with five or six open freight cars into which the entire camp population was herded. No sooner were the prisoners loaded when their train departed heading east toward Czechoslovakia, leaving that hopeful sound of exploding American artillery shells far behind. Let's hear what happened next. We were in these cars for five days and five nights without food or water, five days. And on the fifth day, the locomotive stopped working and we were on a siding in Graslitz in Czechoslovakia and there we stood and we were waiting for another locomotive to take us the rest of the way. At that time we had no idea where that was and what it was to be for. And all of a sudden American planes who by this time had complete control in the air uh, saw our train, attacked us with machine guns and with uh, bombs and everybody ran including the guards and when the guards realized that these prisoners were escaping and they did this attack was over in less than a minute just took, took seconds for two planes diving down and straining the train uh, they threw a cordon around the area to gather all the fleeing prisoners in and a friend of mine and myself we just happened to have run fast enough and we were outside the cordon and we were free. And by the way, those shoes that I mentioned before enabled me to run fast enough. Without those, I could never have made it. So when I said that they saved my life, that's what I meant. This escape was short-lived, however. They wandered through the forests of Czechoslovakia toward the sound of artillery. After five days of walking, they turned a corner and saw two Nazis who pulled their guns arrested them and put them in jail. In jail, they learned their next destination. With the allied forces gaining ground every day, the Nazis wanted to accelerate the killing of Jews and had built portable gas chambers. My grandfather and his friend were taken to them, or were to be taken to them. The next morning, two guards were assigned to escort them on foot to these portable gas chambers about 12 miles away. On the way, they stopped at a Gestapo headquarters so the guards could get more information on exactly where the portable gas chambers were located. One Nazi went upstairs to find out the location and the other was left to guard my grandfather and his friend. Either the man was extremely stupid or they got help from some mysterious force because the guard wanted to smoke a cigarette but didn't have any matches. He saw a man smoking in the distance so he turned to my grandfather and said, don't you go away, I'll be right back and he went to get matches. By the time he was halfway to the man who was smoking, my grandfather and his friend turned the corner, ran into the forest, and never saw the guards again. This time, they changed their strategy and stayed off of paths in hope of not being discovered by Nazis. After wandering west for two more weeks and surviving on raw potatoes and grass, they came upon a farmhouse. They watched this farmhouse for hours and noticed that there were only women there. They decided to take a chance by walking to the building and asking the women for help. The women were wonderful and they provided food that my grandfather and his friend hadn't seen in years. They also told my grandfather that they were in luck just one mile from the American front lines and they could crawl to reach those lines at night. That evening, after darkness filled the sky, they began crawling toward the end of their long journey. All of a sudden, an artillery battle between the Germans and Americans began. They spent the whole night on their stomachs, trying to avoid crossfire, waiting until dawn, at which point they continued moving. Finally, from out behind a tree, jumped an American soldier. The soldier quickly realized who they were, and he took them to his, his commanding officer, who sent them to be supplied with food and put up with housing. 
They were sprayed with DDT because they were crawling with lice and given new clean clothes. This happened on April 28, 1945. At last, the war and its Nazi era was over for my grandfather. The war in Europe would end 10 days later on May 8th. My grandfather weighed 85 pounds, but he was alive. His 20th birthday was six months later, and with it, the end of a 12-year nightmare. After several months, he found my great-grandmother's name, Bianca, on the list of survivors. They were reunited about a month later. It turned out she was never transported away from Theresienstadt and survived there until the camp was liberated. She would live to be 90 years old and passed away on February 2nd, 1983, about a year and a half before I was born. I unfortunately never had the opportunity to meet her, but my dad would often describe her as a devoted wife, loving mother, and doting grandmother. Of the 500 Jews deported from Maastricht, only five returned alive, three besides my grandfather and his mother, exactly 1%. For each of those who survived, there were millions of others whose voices were lost forever to the Nazi wrath of evil. Among the victims of my grandfather's closest family include his father, sister, grandmother, two uncles, two aunts, and three cousins. After the war, he and his mother spent two years in Maastricht before immigrating to New York in May of 1947. My grandfather continued his career as a tool and die maker when arriving in the US. He served a short stint in the US Army during the Korean War and got engaged to my, got engaged to my grandmother, Eva Katzenstein, in 1950 after knowing her for only six weeks. In 1958, they moved to Chicago where he took over an uncle's business that sold first aid supplies. They were married for 46 years before he passed away in 1997. He would retire in 1986 and spend his free time with family on the golf course, traveling and exercising his artistic talents through sculpting. Shown here are a few of his works, including the menorah on the bottom left corner of the slide, which depicts various scenes from the Torah. Today, that menorah can be seen displayed proudly in the museum's library. His legacy includes his two sons, six grandchildren, five of whom he actually met, and his first great grandchild, the start of the next generation of Thalheimers. <clears throat> Each of us would certainly not be here if it weren't for his minute to minute approach to living, that blue armband, that tool and die making apprenticeship, that better pair of shoes, that train breaking down, or that Nazi who needed to smoke his cigarette. When speaking to groups, my grandfather was often asked why he would share his story and revisit so many painful memories. Here was his response. Well, what I usually tell my youthful audience is they sometimes ask me, why do you go through the agony of reliving all these horrible experiences? And I say, there's three reasons. The first one is that, uh, and I always quote the uh, famous American author Santayana, who said, unless you remember your past, you will be doomed to relive it. I don't want my children, my grandchildren, and my great grandchildren ever to have to live, relive what I had to go through. Secondly, is today with the revisionists that claim that the Holocaust is nothing but a Jewish hoax. Well, I am an eyewitness. I'm here to testify that it was not a hoax. It was when they uh, would be found, would be believed, and would be like killing my father, my sister, uh, uncles, aunts, cousins, that grandmother that all were killed, uh, like killing them a second time. I won't let that happen. I won't let them get away with it. Because I was there and I want to testify to the fact that everything I said is the God's honest truth. And I was there to testify to that. And the third reason is I appeal to my audience that they should fight prejudice on every level. That that is really my, the bottom line of my message. Not be standing by when somebody makes abusive remarks about some other race or religion. And I'd say, well, it doesn't concern me. And I always quote the famous quote by uh, uh, Niemöller the pastor Niemöller, 
who said in the beginning the Nazis came for the Jews, mm -hmm. and he wasn't a Jew, and they came for this and that and the other thing, and finally, when they came for him, there was nobody there anymore to uh, uh, speak up for him. He said, that's what the Germans did, that's what the world did. They stood by and watched without doing anything. Don't be passive. When you see an injustice, stand up and speak up and take a stand. Don't be onlookers. Be participants in this society of ours. And that is my message to the children. It is my honor having this opportunity to continue my grandfather's legacy of educating others in order to, height, in order to fight hatred, indifference, and genocide in today's world. And I sincerely thank each of you for taking the time to help preserve his memory. Thank you so much. Uh, are you up for a couple questions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, the first one is, uh, how were you able to get such details um, on dates and experiences? So I'm very fortunate that um, my grandfather spent, you know, a good portion toward, you know, towards the end of his life educating others and speaking to groups, schools, businesses, etc. And um, he detailed his testimony, both um, written as well as through various videos. And I think he put in a lot of time going back and retracing his steps to confirm dates, et cetera. So um, I, I would like to say that I did the research myself, but I had a lot of it done already for me, fortunately. Right. Um, when did you, when did your grandfather first kind of share his story with you? When, what was that like? So I remember, I think I may have been, you know, nine or 10 years old. Uh, my brother and I slept over at my grandparents' house. Uh, we had a, a nice Shabbat dinner on Friday night, woke up Saturday morning, and he sat us down on the couch and he told us his story. Um, that is, is the first time I remember hearing it. And I, of course, had, had heard it, you know, several times since then. Um, but that, I have a distinct memory of, you know, being sat down and, and it was a very casual conversation. You know, he was explaining his story and we had a dialogue back and forth. My brother and I had learned a little bit about the Holocaust at that time, um, but we were asking questions, you know, as we went and that was the first time we were told. Um, which part of the museum would you recommend to visitors? And, you know, can they find your grandfather in certain parts of the museum? Um, he is in a couple parts. Uh, to, I think there's a couple photos of him, but um, in terms of, you know, exhibits at the museum, I think the Take a Stand Center as well as the, the holography exhibit where you can, you know, essentially interact with, with a hologram of a survivor is pretty incredible. Um, and you can ask specific questions that you may have. Um, I know that the Shoah Foundation was involved in, in um, putting that together as well. And that's pretty, um, it, it, it's pretty, um, significant, the, the feeling that you leave, you know, after you know, kind of having that, that experience. Um, how did your family find these uh, photos and belongings after the war and after things were taken at the camp? So um, some of the photos uh, were sent over um, to family in the U.S. Um, and then um, some of the photos more recently we went through, I spent some time when I was putting this presentation together, just kind of digging through boxes uh, of old photos. Um, uh, but yeah, most of the photos that took place during the war were sent over to family members in the U.S. that my grandfather um, re or was able to, to get back when he, when he arrived over here. Um, and when did he first start sharing his experience um, with like groups and with the museum and whatnot? You know, I, I think that um, when the that Nazi march took place in Skokie um, 40, 40, 50 years ago now, I think that was was really the driving force for him to to get involved and start speaking out just to again to the thought that that, you know, seeing seeing the march and thinking that, you know, we can't let something like this happen again. I think that was when he took it upon himself to really start speaking and educating and sharing his story to, you know, in hopes of ensuring that, you know, something like the Holocaust never happens again. Um, what was it like growing up as a grandchild of survivors? Did your parents ever talk about growing up as children of survivors? My dad didn't really talk about it that much. Um, I know as a, as a grandchild, um, I just had a feeling of pride. Um, you know, actually in the show of video um, at the end of his interview, they brought, 
um, my family down you know, just to say some words. And I was watching my 11 year old self, um, you know, with, with my giant ears at the time, um, you know, give a response. And I just talked about how, how proud I was and honored I was to have a grandfather who not only, you know, was able to survive this horrendous experience, but also, you know, relived painful memories um, in order, you know, in hopes of, of the greater good. Um, and so I know speaking for myself and I think my family would share, share the sentiment that we just all had immense pr pride um, for, for what, he, what he was doing. Um, did, did you ever learn what happened to his friend, Frank? Um, his friend, Frank, um, actually committed suicide um, several years after the war. Um, how would your grandfather like to be remembered? You know, I think he would like to be remembered, um, you know, for leaving his, leaving his legacy, um, you know, and making a mark. Um, you know, obviously no one wants to go through what he did or, or any other survivor had to go through as well. But, um, I think taking that and trying to turn it into something positive, um, I think is really the legacy that, that he, he wanted to leave. And I think, you know, through, you know, his various forms of documentation, um, you know, I think um, he would be very proud to see, you know, that his memory lives on and, and is still, you know, you know, doing good out there. Um, are there words your grandfather referenced his experience, uh, in his experience that have changed over the years, like Shoah and Holocaust? Well, I'm sorry, say that again? Um, are there words that your grandfather referenced about his experience that have changed over the years? Like specific, specific words? Yeah, like Shoah and Holocaust is what's here. Not that I, not that I recall. Um, did your grandfather ever return to Europe or did your family ever go? And... Yes, um, my grandfather went back on a trip with my grandmother. Um, they went to a few different countries, including Germany. Um, and they went to his childhood home. Um, actually, we found a, an album uh, with photos of several of the buildings that they lived in, including their original home in Oregon. Um, and uh, um, so they did, they did go back and, uh, and see everything. Okay. Um, and what got you involved with the museum? When did you decide to start sharing his story? Yeah, so um, I got involved with the museum, I think about five years ago now, uh, as a member of the Young Professional Committee. Um, I wanted to do something to honor his legacy, again, just to continue to, to share his story. Um, and so I've been involved with that. And then the museum offered, um, second and third generation speaker training. And when I heard about that, was of course interested in, in, um, in, in learning more as well. So went through training over the summer and um, you know, I, I, you know, the presentation was, was obviously approved and um, it's just, you know, I feel like my responsibility now that he's no longer here. Um, and I know my, my, my brother and, and cousins feel the same way to just continue to, to share his story. So um, it was really driven by, you know, his, his memory and wanting to do something to honor his legacy. Um, will you and your brother and your cousins continue to share his story with the next generation? I think so. Um, I think so. I, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I, I can imagine. So my brother just had his first uh, kid uh, who, who just turned two. So I'm sure that uh, we will be, uh, or he or all a combination of us, my dad as well, will be telling him the story at some point and, uh, you know, hopeful that, that, you know, future generations as well will continue to, to be told the story. And, um, yeah, I think it's also important too, just that it's being documented. Obviously the, the show footage is, is his firsthand account. Um, there's about three hours of footage there. I obviously had to cut out a lot of detail, but, um, we're very fortunate that he did, um, you know, conduct that interview before he passed away. So you have his firsthand account to available to show future generations um as opposed to just kind of telling it telling it secondhand um that's amazing did your grandfather's experience change the way he practiced religion i don't think so um and actually interestingly um this is something that i found interesting so so my grandfather was raised religious um and they kept kosher and once things started to change in europe it was very difficult to um, it was harder to keep kosher. Um, you know, kosher meat wasn't as, as widely available, et cetera. And at the time, his mother said to their family saying, you know, I can't 
we can't get kosher meat. So, so, but if you want to eat, continue to eat meat, you know, that's your choice. It won't be kosher, but you know, go for it. She decided to um, become a vegetarian uh, at the time to avoid eating kosher meat. My grandfather made that same decision. Um, so he, you know, refused to eat non-kosher meat. My father or his father and sister actually decided, you know, that they, they didn't mind. They wanted to eat kosher meat. And interestingly, they were the two that did not survive. Um, yeah, I'm not saying that, that that's the reason why. Uh, I would certainly wouldn't say that, but it was just interesting to me that the two of them who remained kosher throughout the war uh, were the two that survived. And then to your question on religion, um, he, you know, was, was religious his whole life. I don't think he, you know, looked at the, his experience as questioning anything in God. He remained religious, kept kosher, went to, went to shul, et cetera. So, um, uh, yeah, it didn't, really didn't have much, much impact. And, and if anything, you know, he might say that, you know, you know, God helped him survive, um, you know, which, which made him, you know, believe more. Amazing. Um, if you could ask your grandfather anything about his experience after retelling his story, what would you ask? There was one piece uh, of the puzzle that I, I think was missing. One of the story that I told about in Westerbork when he was able to hide that blue armband to gather his family um, after their, their cards had been drawn to be uh, deported to Auschwitz. You know, he obviously got them out. But my question was, well, then what happened if they're index card was pulled to go in that transport, then they didn't have a card in the file. And I, I, there was a little bit of a missing puzzle piece there that I didn't quite find the answer to. So I would ask for a little clarity there. Um, I think that is all the questions we have right now. So I will let you close us out. Okay. Um, thank you so much again to each of you who took the time to watch. Uh, join us here next Wednesday, February 17th at 10 o'clock a.m. Central Time to hear second generation speaker Doris Lazarus share her, her, her father's story of survival and her parents' post-war journey. Please keep an eye on Illinois Holocaust Museum's Facebook and other social media accounts where we will post a stream of content through the weeks ahead. Thank you for your support during these extraordinary times.